Greetings, Earthlings. Today we're going to go over swarm intelligence and synchronization. As with the previous videos in this series, I'm not going to go over absolutely everything. I'm trying to give you guys an overview so you can explore this topic on your own. All right, so what is it and some key ideas. So swarm intelligence can be defined as the collective behavior that emerges from decentralized and self-organizing units or agents. So let me unpack that. The key idea is to, to simplify. There's many agents, so this could be animals, this could be robots, it could be anything. There's some local rules. So the local rules, for example, let's say this is a school of fish. So the local rule would be stay three feet away from your neighbor. In other words, you don't have access to what the guy 700 feet away is doing. So only stuff dealing with your neighbors and yourself. And from these, following some local rules and many agents, there is a complex behavior that emerges. The key word here is emerges. So, for example, uh, well, we'll get to the example. So by emergence, there is no blueprint and it's bottom up. So if you think about, let's say, a king or a dictator, the king gives the order, so that's top down. In this behavior, whether it's ants or fish or birds or whatever animals, each bird is an agent and each of them does something sort of semi-intelligent on their own and altogether this behavior propagates bottom up to produce some sort of global behavior for the whole species that is reasonably intelligent. Okay, so there's no blueprint or like correct sort of answer that they're all trying to follow. So these are two principles. All right. So who cares? So I'm pretty much gonna echo this part again, which is like, what's the significance? What's the importance? The emergence of complexity or intelligence can come from these local rules, these local heuristic rules. I'll explain what that is. So just to th one way of thinking about it is these local rules can are pretty stupid. So they're not completely stupid. You could think of them as semi-intelligent. You know, the cup is either halfway full or half empty, but basically, each fish is not very bright, or each bird is not very bright, or the, the behavior it's doing is not very bright, but altogether the flock of birds or whatever it is, they can produce some very profound behavior. So each of these is only doing something somewhat intelligent, but together it's gonna become very impressive. And you'll see, I think this will hit home a little more once we go through the examples. So heuristic just means rule of thumb. So a rule of thumb, like I said earlier, might be stay about three feet away from your neighbor. Is that the optimal thing? It may not be the optimal, but it might be a reasonable thing if you're a bird, let's say. Okay, so the, the point is we can get some really cool behavior out of pretty stupid behavior, almost stupid behavior. All right, so what are the applications? So I really want to focus this video on the applications. And also, I'm going to say this at the end, but make sure to check out the links in the description there'll be a ton of stuff for you to look at. All right, so typically when you think of swarm intelligence, it has to do a lot with animals. So you have ant colonies, bee swarms, that's the name swarm, schools of fish, flocks of birds, it could be other animals, doesn't matter. Uh, so ant colonies, each ant is doing its own little thing, but taken together, they're helping build the colony. They're helping the colony survive. Each bee might be doing its own little dance to indicate where there's food, but together, all of them can find food pretty accurately and pretty well. So, in the links, you guys can read a lot more about these. These are some typical examples and applications. Wisdom of the crowds. That's not, the red star indicates that it's not really swarm intelligence, but it's indirectly related, so I just wanted to throw it in here. So, what is wisdom of the crowds? A typical example would be, there's a jar of marbles, and each person in the crowd is asked to give their best guess as to how many marbles are in the jar. So let's say I say there's 400, you say there's 275. And if we take the average of all the guesses, that's gonna tend to be pretty good, but pretty accurate. So in other words, each person's gonna have some error and if you average their guesses, that error is gonna kind of be eliminated. Somebody's way too high, somebody's way too low, but th so there's a lot of a lot of cool stuff here, so check this out in the, in the description. Urban planning, city design, so I'll just say that I'll leave it at that. Computer science, there's something called the boosting algorithm, and actually one of my professors in college, I think he's the, one of the co-inventors or the inventor of this, and what this is, is it follows a lot of very 
simple rules and each of those rules is not very good at solving the problem but when you combine them they can produce they can solve some very complicated problems all right the traveling salesman problem in the links in the description there will be some great uh, stuff documentaries and otherwise the traveling salesman problem is the problem where you have a lot of cities or points and you want to find the shortest path to hit all the points now to, to actually go through all the possibilities is going to take a lot of time so people use ant, ant colony optimization which is inspired by ant colonies so they'll create some digital ants that will go along these paths and leave a scent a pheromone scent a trail and basically other ants these digital ants that you can create simulations for if they detect a scent they're more likely to take that path so why would that solve the problem because the shorter paths are going to have a stronger uh, scented trail so in other words the winners are going to tend to win more and the losers are going to stop being pursued so if if you found a really bad path other ants are less likely to follow it so that that's a very cool application so i just want to emphasize this is not the solution to this problem because it doesn't perfectly solve it but it's a really good heuristic because it's like for example let's say the optimal solution took you a thousand miles this one may find one that takes you a thousand and two miles so it's reasonably good to the optimal all right a uh, life so amino acid and by the way a lot of these i'm going to again check the link in the description a lot of these examples not all of them but a lot of them are taken from this wonderful lecture number 22 see the description from a professor sapolsky so if you watch that you can get a lot more on this so life amino acids protein folding so if you think about it there's basically two there's probably more but there's at least two rules which is things either attract or they repel so just using those two simple local rules which is just are you attracted to your neighboring amino acid or not that is the basis for the formation of a lot of life and proteins neuron structure so i won't say more about that uh physics so the the or basically the nature of the universe electrons I, you could i'll let you guys think more about this but think this might be a really uh fruitful area to think about some more so how might everything that's going on in the universe and fundamental laws of nature be related to some basic local rules in other words an electron att attracts this and all that basically results in human societies all right the human brain uh, neural networks both actual biological human brains but also in computer science you can simulate that so each neural networks con a network consists of a, a ton of little cells either digital or biological and each cell doesn't do anything too intelligent so one cell might just say hey do i detect a black line on this board yes or no uh, or it might even say do i detect a horizontal black line and if you abstract that up several layers say okay now that i can detect lines can i detect squares so if you keep going up and up and combining all those little basic rules you get basically a human that's capable of detecting faces and crazy things or even uh these days machines that are capable of doing that all right so i'll leave it at that uh digestion so you might have thousands millions of bacteria and each bacteria is doing its own bacterium is doing its own little thing processing something and all together it results in this profound phenomenon of helping you digest food or giving you indigestion so now these local rules may not be in your favor all right uh cellular automata so again study this further look in the description there's kind of two things on this you might want to look into stephen wolf wolfram's work and john conway's game of life so and that'll be in the description evolutionary algorithms has to do a lot with computer science and you you create digital things and they evolve using some mutations and stuff like that i i just i'm just putting this on your map i'm not trying there's no way I, i'm doing an adequate job covering it but if you want to learn more just look that up power law distributions all right so all these are applications but if you think about a lot of these local rules there are some statistical properties that emerge so on the global level so that's the stats part right here and a lot of the times it's these power law distributions and if you want to read more again i'm not going to attempt to butcher an explanation in five seconds go and read more about that but there i think it will be accessible to a lot of sort of the intermediate level folks uh, amongst you 
So this has to do with Earth helping model earthquakes, language, uh, internet connectivity, so many things. Some specific things, for example, is our ZIPS law and Benford's law. This has to do with language word frequency and this has to do with, uh, I think, digital frequency. So this is actually useful in fraud detection. So for example, if you're making up numbers uh, and like in your accounting, you might think like, well, let's just make up an equal number of fours and fives and sixes and sevens. But actually, real data that hasn't been made up fraudulently has a distribution that's not uniform. And so most people don't know that. So I'll let you guys check that out. Uh, another thing, this is the two red stars mean that means that it's not at all directly related. So very indirectly related, but sort of inspired by the same topic as Stein's paradox. Now, of all the stuff here, this is only for the very advanced folks amongst you because this is going to involve a lot to... Uh, there's links in the description, but to follow this, you're going to need a lot of background, some statistics. So I suspect most of the younger audience won't be able to follow this. But in a nutshell, what is this? So let's say you have three or more baseball players and the baseball player's batting average was 400, so 0 0.400. And you want to predict what is their bat batting average going to be next season or in the second half of the season. So you would think, well, since their previous batting average is 400, the best I can do is just predict that it'll be 400 again. And very counterintuitively and shockingly, it turns out that you can do better than just by using their past average by incorporating some of the statistics from the other players, which is very, very, uh, very counterintuitive. So I'll let you guys think about that. You might think baseball, who, okay, it's just a sport. This applies to infectious diseases and predicting out, outbreaks in hospitals. So a lot of very cool applications there. All right, so we're sort of wrapping up on some of the applications. One theme, and this is a lot of this, I, like I said, is taken from this lecture number 22 from Professor Sapolsky. So one of the theme with, themes with swarms is you have a lot of ants or fish or robots doing something only semi-intelligent, and you might think, well, if you scale this up, it's still going to be pretty stupid. But it turns out, remember keyword emergence, so with a lot of quantity, not always, but sometimes quality emerges. So a good example of, these are two good examples. So apes versus humans, you might think, well, we have a lot of our DNA in common, so like, why, why are humans so much smarter, you know, different than apes? And one of the things uh, Professor Sapolsky points out is one of the, those differences might correspond to the number of rounds of cell division. And that's a pretty crucial factor. So just by having more of the same stuff, it can make you supremely more intelligent. So if you go back to neural networks, a computer that has, let's say, a thousand whatever units processing things can only do certain things. But if you now have 2,000 units or 4,000, you can run way more intricate programs. So quantity becoming quality. Also, chess. So back in the days when computers started playing chess, they weren't very good. In fact, every any intermediate player could beat them. Then they started getting pretty advanced to the point of being like at a master level. And people weren't sure if they could ever beat humans. But in, I forget the exact year, but somewhere in the late 90s, 2000s, uh, the world chess champion then Gary Kasparov lost to, I think, Deep Blue to a chess engine. Now, how did that happen? So the way chess, in a nutshell, the way these chess programs work is they calculate every scenario or many possible scenarios, many moves ahead. So what means, what's one way to create a better chess program it's one that can calculate more moves ahead so it has more processing power so before let's say it could calculate 12 moves ahead but now it can calculate 13 moves ahead now they may, that may not seem impressive but every time you do one extra move ahead the number of scenarios grows exponentially so you might say well 12 was at a master level but as soon as it went to like 13 moves ahead 14 moves ahead 15 moves ahead suddenly this is in grandmaster and world-class level and the program started either tying or beating the humans so again the pro the quality of the chess programs didn't improve much but although it did in certain areas but the main thing that it improved is the processing so the quantity so with quantity we get quality sometimes not always all right now and here are two examples that i, I thought uh that i wanted to make up that would be sort of unique for you guys unique for me living in new york city 
So one example might be salsa music. It's not a direct example, but it's sort of loosely inspired. If you look at all the instruments in salsa, Latin salsa music, you have bongos, congas, all these uh, piano, all these rhythmic things going on. And if you just listen to one part, like the congas, it's not... I mean, it, it might sound pretty cool, but after a while, you'll pretty much get the hang of it and you'll feel like, hey, this is kind of stupid. It's not very exciting. So each musician is not doing something world like, like rocket science, but it's together that all these instruments create this really, to my taste, great music that's very intricate. And you could, you know, if you, depending on what part of the world you're in, you could substitute whatever you want. It could be, I don't know, uh, I, I'm not going to go through the list of music, but... So think where you live, is there maybe there's music or art that is made up of a lot of little things that are only kind of good, but together they make something that's greater than the sum of the parts. All right, uh, city culture. So this is gonna lead us into another theme. And I haven't seen this pointed out, been, uh, like pointed out in other places, so I wanted to emphasize this. So you might think that the city, the culture of a city depends on its people. So like, let's take New York City culture specifically, let's say the subway in New York City. So I'll, many of you might not know, but a lot of people might be familiar. It's kind of hectic. There's supposedly a lot of rude people. It's crazy. Now, you might think, well, that's because New Yorkers are just rude people. And so if you, if you have a lot of like low, low, rude people on this low level, then the global behavior that's going to emerge is just this massive rudeness. But I want to point out that while you have these local rules or these local, that local behavior, each person doing their own thing, local rules evolve for a specific environment. So there's also this top-down effect of the environment affecting people. So some people might say, oh, Southerners in the U U.S. are much nicer than Easterners or New Yorkers. Uh, they have more manners, all that stuff. There, there might be some truth to that, so I'm not discounting it, but I just want to throw out an idea, which is... I've been on the New York subway, let's say, on, on two different occasions. During rush hour, where there's a lot of people, and during off-peak times, where there's like five or six people in the car. Now, when it's rush hour, it's crazy. People are fighting for seats. You see some of the nastiest behavior. You also see nice behavior, but you see a lot of nasty behavior. But during the off-peak times, people, on average, you might have some drunk people, but uh, people are, are pretty nice to each other. They're not fighting for seats. So like you might be wondering like why? Well, yeah, of course, it's, there's no scarcity. So if you introduce scarcity, supposedly nice people can become really, can become jerks. So I would counter to people say, oh, a lot of New Yorkers are rude. I would say it's not so much the New Yorkers, it's the environment. So if you take pe people from the South, Southerners, put them in New York City, um, at first they might just be overwhelmed and shocked by what's going on. But if they live here for a few years, they will become the same rude New Yorkers. So it's the environment. If you have more subways, less crowding, or you're at an off-peak time, the behavior will be different. So I want to emphasize that all these like ant colonies, these bee swarms, they have this awesome, these little rules that produce intelligent behavior, but it produces that behavior that's suited to an environment. So if you take all these ants and have them live in water, their little rules might not be as effective in water, or maybe they're special water ants or something. So you got to consider both directions, the local rules, but also the effect of the environment that gives you the effectiveness of the local. So people are people everywhere, right? So I would wager if you take a New Yorker and put them in the South and they live there, they'll probably become a nicer person. And you would think, oh, they, it's not because they become a nicer person. The environment is slower paced. It's less conducive to stressing out. So again, I want you guys, I really want to emphasize this environment theme and, um, so like let, let, let me let the others know in the comments about these two and maybe you know the area you live in, can you think of examples that are specific to your culture, your region that, that have something along these lines? All right, so I'm gonna leave it there. Explore, explore more, have fun. The only requirement is that you guys have fun in your learning. So check out the links in the description. There's a few that are pretty useful and some that are really like bonus for the people that really wanna get into the weeds. And I'll see you guys in the next video.